Let's please be seated. The song at the conclusion of Tommy's lesson this morning will be near to the heart of God. Let's be seated. Well, it's certainly good to be able to assemble on this Lord's Day. It's a beautiful day. And we're glad that you're with us. If you're visiting, we're honored to have you in our assembly. It's always a joy and a privilege to have visitors come and be with us, and we thank you for that. <clears throat> it's good to have those who are live streaming. We appreciate you doing that as well. I talked to you a couple of weeks ago about pleasing God, emphasizing that Jesus is the only human being who ever lived who completely, totally pleased God. He did so by always doing those things that pleased him. As John chapter 8 and verse 29 emphasizes, he said, I always do the things that please the Father. There's not a one of us here who can say that we always, always do what pleases God. And we emphasize in that study, there are certain people who can never please God. The carnally minded, fleshly minded individuals, the self-centered the disobedient and those who seek the pleasure of men instead of the service of God cannot please God. Now, we all fall short of the glory of God as indicated in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. So that leaves us to understand that since we can't always please God, can we please Him at all? And the answer to that is yes. We can please God. And there are certain things the Bible tells us that we must do. We must have an ambition to please God. We must desire to do that. We must learn to please Him, as Paul said in Ephesians 5 and verse 10. We must be guided by the gospel in what we do in order to please Him. And we must walk to please God, as Paul indicated in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And the children obeying their parents pleases God. That's another way that we please God. So the Bible clearly indicates that we can indeed please God. Now, that brings to mind a question that perhaps may be a doubt in your mind or a thought in your mind. That can we fully please God? I don't know if you've ever wondered in your mind whether you fully please God or not, but I suspect you have. I have. Am I fully pleasing God? How can I know that I'm fully pleasing the God of heaven? How does one fully please God? What's the evidence of a person who fully pleases God? And how does God make us fit so that we can please Him? These are questions I want to talk to you about in our study this morning. But let me emphasize again that not a one of us lives without sin. When we reach the age where we're accountable unto God, we're guilty of sin. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. When we reach the age where we know right and wrong and we're accountable for what we do and we sin, then we find ourselves in a terrible predicament. And none of us can think that we earn our salvation. We don't. We can't earn it. We don't deserve it. It's God's favor, God's grace, His unmerited, undeserved, unearned favor by which we can be saved. But when we are saved by the grace of God, that ought to cause us to want to obey Him and to love Him because of the tremendous debt that we have as He has forgiven our sins. And when He does, that places a tremendous obligation on each one of us to serve Him as best we can. And so that's what I want to talk to you about this morning in our study is how is it that we fully please God? So let's begin our study by noting that one does fully please God by being filled with the knowledge of His will. Turn your Bible to Colossians chapter 1 and read verse 9 and also the first part of verse 10. Here's what Paul had to say in his prayer. For this reason also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you that, and ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will. A person needs to be filled with the knowledge of His will and he continues to say, in all spiritual a wisdom and spiritual understanding that you may walk worthy of the Lord. So he indicates that we can indeed fully please God. Not that we're sinless, that'll never happen. But we can please Him. And we can fully please Him. But that means that we must be filled with the knowledge of His will. Filled with the knowledge of the Word of God. Now how many times in the past week have you sought out the will of God by Bible study? 
I'm not just talking about here at the church building on Wednesday and Sunday when we come for Bible study. I'm talking about through the week. Have you spent any time wondering what it is God has in his word for you to do and to believe? Have you spent any time studying your Bible? Now, a person who is knowledgeable of the word of God, who's filled with the knowledge of his will, and let me emphasize that, we must be filled with the knowledge of his will. How many of us are filled with the knowledge of his will? Oh, we may be filled with sports. Basketball is going hot and heavy. I don't think they've had the final game yet, but I'm, I don't keep up with it that much. But I know there's a lot of interest. And the young lady who is a, a three-point shooter, she's really a famous young lady right now, and, and she has made women's basketball uh, in the limelight and certainly put it in people's minds and attention and, and gave great interest to the women's sports and, and there are other sports that people are engaged in and they're involved in that and, and there's uh, football going on now it seems like the minor league football season is in full swing how many of us are so involved in that and yet so little involved in studying our Bibles being filled with the knowledge of God's will now that's something you need to think about that's how we please God. We don't please God by going through life without a concern for what his word has to say. We need to be filled with the knowledge of his will. And he goes on to say, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And what that means is that we must have an accurate understanding of the truth and be able to apply it to our lives. And again, we can emphasize this by noting the little word all. All wisdom and spiritual understanding. How many of us have that kind of desire to, work, to, to know the word of God and to be able to apply it to our lives? You know, you may be excellent in your understanding of the principles of mathematics, as Carrie could tell you. You may know all about reading and writing arithmetic and how that you can use arithmetic and so forth but if you don't know how to apply it to everyday situations what good does it do you know there's going to be an eclipse this week as has been on radio and TV if you've noticed that and the reason why they can calculate when we're going to have it what states are going to be involved in seeing it completely is because of mathematics they have it figured out mathematically they can tell you when the next one's going to come I think they said in 2045. Well, I won't probably be here by then. If I am, I'll be old. <laughs> I'm already old. I'll be super old. Now, they can do that and, and figure exactly what states are going to be involved, and they can figure when it's going to come because of mathematics. And that's because of the knowledge that they have. Now, how many of us have such a burning desire to learn God's word that we want to know how to live each day and we want to put that into practice in all spiritual understanding and wisdom? And he says the evidence is going to be shown that we're doing that when we are fruitful in every good work. Did you catch that? Fruitful in every good work. It says in Colossians 1 and verse 10 that you might walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work. Now let me emphasize the word every because that's what he's talking about, every good work. How many of us desire to be fruitful in every good work? Well, what's, what's a good work? Well, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 tells us, For by grace you've been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Salvation by grace through faith is the gift of God. It doesn't come from man. It came from God. And he says, not of works as anyone should boast. Now he's not talking about works of obedience or works of faith. He's talking about meritorious works. He's talking about works that earn our salvation. We're not saved that way. If that were the case, it would eliminate the grace of God. But God's grace, God's undeserved, unearned, unmerited favor is what saves us. And it's not by works that we can boast about. He says, for we are his workmanship. Now you think about that. 
I think about some of the projects that Kerry has made in his workshop, and they, they've been really outstanding from the pictures. I don't know what they look like in real life, but they look really good, and it looks professional to me. That's his workmanship. We are God's workmanship. Think of that. We're what God produces. God don't make no junk. And he makes you and me, he makes us in the likeness of his son. We're his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So God prepared beforehand. Before the world was ever created, God had in his mind what he wanted his people to be, the good works he wanted them to do. So if you want to know what it is that you need to do to please God, look at the Bible, read the Bible, understand the Bible. And you'll find everything revealed that you need to know to do the good works God wants you to do. Now, you may find some self-help books. I, I don't know why I keep thinking about Kerry, but I, I think about what he told me. He went to a bookstore and asked for the self-help section, and the lady said, well, if I tell you, that'll defeat the purpose of the self-help. So... <laughs> So the fact of the matter is, you may find some self-help books, but those books will help you in practical ways, if they're truthful and right, to carry out the principles of God's Word. There's not a single thing that you need to know about how to live your life to please God and the good works that you need to do that's not revealed in the Word of God, either explicitly or in principle. Now, you may find some books that give you some practical ways to carry out how to be a good husband or how to be a good wife or whatever, but you're going to find everything you need to know in the Word of God. Every good work. And he says increasing in the knowledge of God. And that doesn't mean that you just increase in your ability to memorize and quote Scripture. It means a relationship with God. A knowledge of God involves knowing Him personally, knowing Him in a relationship, knowing Him in an ever-increasing love for Him every single day, increasing in the knowledge of God. And then he talks about strengthening with all might. And it's interesting when you think about what he said in that regard, in Colossians 1 and verse 11, strengthen with all might according to His glorious power for all patience and long-suffering with joy. Now think about that. Think about what Paul is saying there. He says, I want you to be strengthened with all might. Well, how can I be strengthened with all might when I'm filled with the knowledge of God's word and I'm fruitful in every good work and I'm increasing in the knowledge of God and that's going to enable me to be strengthened? Well, what do I need strengthened for? What do I need to be strengthened for? Temptation comes. I need to be strong enough to overcome temptation. I need to be strong enough to overcome the persecution that comes in life. I need to do that, and I'm going to have the strength that I need to have, and I'm going to have all might, all strength. So that what? Well, he goes on to say, strength with all might, so that you may be able to stand up and be a Christian. And he emphasizes three things in that regard. He says, I want you to be strengthened with all might, and that involves patience. We need patience. I saw a bumper sticker one time and said, Lord, give me patience, but hurry. We live in a hurry-up society. Everything has to be done right now. We don't want to wait for anything. Well, we need to learn patience. And patience doesn't mean folding your hands and just living your life, uh, sitting back and waiting for something to happen. It means steadfastness under trial. That when you're tempted, when you're tested, when you're tried, that you're able to withstand that. How can I do that? Because I'm fruitful in every good work. I'm increasing the knowledge of God. Because I'm increasing my knowledge of His will and all ability to accurately understand it and apply it to my life. And that gives me that might, that power that only comes from God and His Word. That's the only way you're going to get that. Not any other way. So, we are in difficult circumstances. And he says not only that, with long suffering. What do I need long suffering for? Well, because some of you people are hard to get along with. 
Now that doesn't apply to the preacher. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm just a, a lovable person. Now my wife would disagree with that if she were here to, to, to argue about that. But we need long suffering with one another. We're not easy to get along with sometimes. We need long suffering. Well, how can I be long suffering toward people? Well, when I increase my knowledge of God's word and I know how to apply it in my life and I understand that God's power and might gives me that spiritual understanding and I'm fruitful in every good work, I'm increasing the knowledge of God and I have the ability to remain steadfast even though I have people in my life that make it difficult to remain a Christian. You know, sometimes people use the expression, my difficulties were such that it really caused me to try my religion. Caused me to lose my religion. No, it shouldn't cause you to lose your religion. It should cause you to use your religion. And when you use it, it's because you have all might and all strength that only comes from God so that you can fully please Him. So that you have the ability to remain steadfast even when you face difficult people. But he goes on to say, and this is really something difficult for some people to understand. He said, I want you to be strengthened with all patience and long suffering with joy. Why did he put that in there? It's not easy to go through difficult times. It's not evil to go through when you're sick or someone you love is sick and has a chronic problem and, and difficulties arise every day. It's not difficult to go through those times. It's not easy to go through when people are against you and, and you're trying to do what's right. It's difficult to live this life when you surrounded with difficult circumstances and difficult people and so forth, but we need to do it with joy, not with bitterness. Now that's what fills the hearts of a lot of folks is just plain bitterness. They're bitter. They allow people to get under their skin. They allow people to aggravate them so that they come out with words that they shouldn't say. Kind of like the little boy who was cutting his grass one day and he was about to start his lawnmower and the preacher walked by and saw him doing that and he said, son, he said, I'll be glad to cut your grass for you. So the little boy said, okay, and he walked away. The little boy came back about 10 minutes later and the guy was pulling on the starter rope and trying to get the thing started and he was broke out in sweat. And he was just really having a hard time getting that lawnmower started. And the little boy said, Mister, if you give that lawnmower a good cussing, it'll start for you. <laughs> the, man, the, boy looked at the, the man looked at the boy and said, Son, you know who I am? I'm a preacher. He said, I hadn't cussed in 20 years. He said, You keep pulling on that rope, it'll come back to you. <laughs> Circumstances are tough. Troubling times come. It's hard. How can I live my life without saying things I shouldn't say? Without doing things I shouldn't do? Only when I have the knowledge of the will of God and all wisdom and spiritual understanding and I'm able to be fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all the might that God can give me. Now, I cannot neglect my study of God's Word and expect these things to happen. They just don't happen by accident. They happen because I've determined that I'm going to study my Bible. I'm going to learn the Word of God. I'm going to do what He wants me to do. And I'm going to do it with joy. I'm going to do it with joy. And then, he says, giving thanks to the Father who qualified us. I can be thankful that God enables me to live the kind of life I need to live. I don't have to worry about if, if I have everything I need because the Father gives me everything I need in His Word to live the kind of life I need to live to please Him. Well, it says the Father who has qualified us. Some versions render it that way. Some say fit us. How is it that God fits us so that we're able to withstand the problems of life? We're able to withstand difficult people. We're able to go through life with joy and not bitterness, and not looking like we were weaned on a sour pickle or baptized in vinegar. But we are joyful Christians. How can we do that? How does God fit us? Well, that gives us the motivation we need because he goes on to say how he does that, and how he does it is, first of all, he delivered us from the power of darkness. 
If you look at your Bible, you'll find where the record says in Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, He's delivered us from the power of darkness. The power that we were under before we became Christians is described as darkness. When a person is not a Christian, they're living in darkness. They're living in ignorance. They're living in sin. And we've been able to overcome that through Christ. He's delivered us out of that power. And not only that, but he's conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. Now think of that. God has taken us from the power of darkness and he's transferred us into the kingdom of his son, which is the church. Jesus made that clear in Matthew 16 when he said, I will build my church to the apostle Peter in verse 18. And in verse 19 said, I'll give unto you the keys of the kingdom. He uses the term interchangeably. They don't mean the same thing, but they apply to the same group of people. The church and the kingdom, the kingdom is the reign of God in the hearts of people, and God reigns in the hearts of those who submitted to his will, and they make up the church that Jesus said, I will build. When a person is a member of the church, that means that they've been delivered from the power of darkness and translated into the kingdom of the son of his love. And then he goes on to say, he has redeemed us. He's forgiven us. In whom we have redemption through his blood, in verse 14 of Colossians 1, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Now how does that happen? It happens by the blood of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. Peter said, Knowing this, we were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by the tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. You see, we were bought back out of the power of sin, the power of darkness. We were bought from that. We were redeemed. That's what redeemed means. It means that we've been bought back out of the service of the devil and we've been bought by the blood of Christ. What a precious price. And the record tells us how that happens. Jesus, when he instituted the Lord's Supper in Matthew 26 and verse 28, said regarding the fruit of the vine, this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for many for the remission of sins. When Jesus shed his blood on the cross, he shed his blood for the remission of our sins. What a beautiful thought. A beautiful thought to think about our Lord willing to die. And we sang a few minutes ago, he died alone. And I think that's one of the terrible, terrible things our Lord had to go through. To die alone. Even his father turned his back. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God could not be one with Christ on the cross bearing the sin of the world. He had to die alone. And he did that because he loved you and he loved me and he loved the world. What a beautiful thought. Well, someone says, well, how do I receive the benefits of that blood? Well, turn to Acts 2.38. You'll find a very simple answer to that. And Peter said to the people on Pentecost, repent after they had come to believe in Jesus as the resurrected Lord in Christ, as he announced in verse 36, therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God made that same Jesus whom you've crucified, both Lord and Christ. When they heard this, they were pricked in the heart and cried, men and brethren, what shall we do? In verse 38 says, Peter said to them, repent, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That same expression for the remission of sins is used in Matthew 26, 28 when the Lord instituted the Lord's Supper. When he said this, talking about the fruit of the vine, is my blood of the covenant which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Whatever the Lord shed his blood for is what a person needs to repent and be baptized for. And the record says it's for the remission of sins. If you've never been baptized, it means you don't have remission of your sins. If you have been baptized, but not for the remission of your sins, you weren't baptized for the right reason. And you can't be taught wrong and obey right. You can't be taught wrong and obey correctly. The only way to obey correctly what the Word of God says is to understand what it says and to be doing what it says because of your desire for the results. And after a person is baptized, what do they do? When they sin, do they, are they baptized again? No, the Bible doesn't teach that. 
It teaches in 1 John 1 and verse 9, as Christians, as Christians, not as alien sinners, but as Christians, I can confess my faults, my sins to God, and he's faithful and just to forgive me and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. God is willing to forgive me when I repent as a Christian, and I'm thankful for that, and I wouldn't give that up for any amount of money. It doesn't matter where I am. It doesn't matter any circumstance, any place, any time. I can pray to God, forgive me when I sin, and he'll forgive me as a child of God. What a beautiful thought. You can fully please the Lord. Not in the sense of being perfect, none of us are, but you can please him in the sense of obeying his word, becoming a Christian, living a faithful life, and being ready to go to heaven when this life is over. Not because you earned it, not because you deserve it, but because God in his mercy and in his grace has been rich and has provided for us salvation through his son. If you hear need to obey him, cry now, we bid you come while we stand and while we sing. <laughs> there is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God. A place where sin cannot molest near to the heart of God. Oh, Jesus. Good to have this number with us this morning. We'll have a word of closing prayer that will end our live stream service, and then we'll have a few announcements. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear God in heaven, we're so very thankful for this day, thankful that we've been able to gather together to study a portion of thy word. We're so appreciative of the lessons that have been prepared this morning, and we pray as we've uh, paid attention and make application in our lives, we might grow stronger in our faith, stronger in our ability to champion your cause on this earth. We're so very thankful for the blessings that have been answered on behalf of those that are struggling with health. We have many that still need your guiding hand in their medical treatment, and we pray that you'll watch over them as they go into procedures even this week, that those procedures will be successful and they'll be able to be brought back to us once again in a good portion of health. We're so appreciative of our opportunities as we come in contact with people, and we pray that we'll be equipped well um, to share your word in such a way that might pre people's uh, interest in you and they might uh, find you ultimately and, and become faithful continue to watch over us keep us safe and healthy if it be thy will in jesus name we pray amen, amen. let's be seated our next time